Our next speaker, uh, uh, Dr. George Barker here, is um, an Irishman pretending to be a Kiwi. Uh, he, he's a director of the Centre for Law and Economics at the Australian National University, a visiting fellow of the, of, of, of the uh, BICL, a visiting fellow of the London School of Economics. And uh, his, his uh, presentation will, will focus on the critical decisions on both on what substantive legal rules to adopt in economic regulation and what procedural arrangements to adopt for the enforcement of, of those rules, with uh, reference in particular to, to the area of competition law, uh, consumer law, and, and anti-dumping. So thank you. I must remember that introduction, an Irishman pretending to be a Kiwi, <laughs> adding uh, working in Australia and based in London, so <laughs> truly global. I will actually put a timer on so that I only speak for 10 minutes, um, but after I turned it off, I'll know long, uh, how long I should have talked. Um, my uh, thanks to Petra for originally uh, uh, for organising this, and uh, I know she's got a New Zealand co uh, background as well, so it's, it's obviously a Kiwi mafia here. Um, Ava was the one who, uh, from Bickel, who originally, Ava Lyon, invited me to talk back in January, and then I, I disappeared for four months. So I've turned up to a much uh, a more exciting event than I could ever hope to contribute to. Thanks as well to Wilma, Cutler, Pickering and Hale for uh, hosting this event, uh, which I commend. The audience is obviously coming from so many different backgrounds, it's hard to find common ground. Uh, even in the academic world, you've got economists and lawyers who don't always talk the same language. But here we've got government officials and representatives, government officials, litigators and arbitrators, and we're all trying to struggle to understand the same subject. Um, so I'll just confuse you even more. Uh, first of all, I've got to find my paper. Um, the, my background in this was uh, I was asked by the Pacific Island Forum to advise them on the formulation of a competition and consumer law uh, for the Pacific Island nations. Um, and, uh, and so that, that stemmed from my original role. I got a PhD in economics from Oxford, but I was chief analyst and economist at the New Zealand Treasury. And so in, in the 80s, I was involved in a lot of the privatisation and regulatory work that was undertaken by Australia, by New Zealand and Australia, to try and create a new platform for economic growth because Britain had joined the EEC and left us in the ocean of the Pacific to fend for ourselves. And at the same time, oil prices had gone through the roof with 1973, so our costs had gone up and our markets had shrunk, and we had to think of our, our future as small states in an unfriendly world. And so you know, what we did was a lot of decisions that were unpopular and required leadership, but ultimately led to economic growth, and uh, Australia and New Zealand have done quite well. That led in the 1990s with the collapse of Russia to doing work in uh, Asia Pacific again on privatisation and deregulation in Korea. Um, and then with the Asian financial crisis and financial market regulation. And so what I wanted to do was uh, just cover things like objectives, contexts and constraints for small states to try and find some common ground. Secondly, highlight actually the, the, the greater importance in consumer and competition law and, and anti-dumping law of the wider economic framework and structural reform that small states have to engage in, because generally they're not very poor and they're not doing a great job for their citizens. I'm afraid as an economist it has to be said that people could be a lot richer in a lot of these countries. Um, that may be due to historical, cultural, colonial and other uh, curses, but ultimately it's about the future and how do they move forward and using decisions that they've got under their control now to make a better world and a better future. And a sustainable one means taking into account not only the the citizens' well-being of today, but the well-being of future citizens as well. So not depleting, say, deep sea mining resources or fishing resources to the point where future generations are compromised. But that will move on then to talking about competition law and enforcement if I have time. And ultimately, that is about the rules that you use to uh, try and achieve a better commercial environment for business, for investment, for exchange, in other words, cooperation, actually, between people who are trying to compete for scarce resources. The, the, this, what that work I did for the Pacific Island Forum quickly read to was, led to was the problem of institutional capability, and then how do you build capability, and uh, I looked at regional institutional arrangements in that regard. Um, as small states, one thing that does stand out as potentially relevant dealing with large states is 
is anti-dumping law and as a trade trade instrument, and it has relationships in a, a vague way to competition, competition law, which I thought was useful to talk to. So just on an overview on this, I think the key thing is clarity of objectives. And as I say, the goal is to optimize well-being of citizens, not only today, but in the future, so sustainably. Uh, so that means clarity about what you're trying to do. And often I find that the decision makers get confused about whether they're trying to promote competition, which is generally seen as by economists as a good mechanism to get people to disclose how much they really do value resources and use resources better and more efficiently, how to protect competition on the one hand, which should promote social welfare, versus how not to protect competitors, which is often the political imperative. How do you favour the people who might support you or vote for you depending on your system? So getting clarity of objectives at a very first stage is very important. The importance of the wider economic framework, I think it's what, what we realized was that you first need to create a good regulatory framework in competition law for, for a large part of the economy which the rest of the economy depends upon, and that's the infrastructure, which constitutes maybe 30 to 40 percent of the economy. Uh, take telecom. Being small and isolated ocean state, you're going to need telecommunications access to the internet. For that, you've got to access capital because telecom is the most capital intensive industry of all. And that's the problem. You can't develop your infrastructure, water, transport, gas, electricity, energy, without capital. You need capital. Then the problem you've got is the people who've got capital will only give it to you if you can assure them they'll get it back with a return at least as good as they could have got elsewhere. So ex ante, a small state is sit sit situated in a position where they're looking forward, wanting to create a better world for their citizens, knowing that like Ulysses and the sirens trying to get home, that if you don't tie your hands to the mast, it's very tempting once they've built the telecom network to nationalize it or regulate it in ways that prices are so low they don't get a return, but the populace is very happy. So if you do realize that that possibility, that incentive exists with a small state, then you must realize that it exists for the investor's mind as well. And that gives you the whole foundation in economics for thinking about institutions uh, as a means of sovereign states making credible commitments to investors to ex access capital markets, lower the cost of capital in a nation, and then allocate that capital to the best use possible. If you don't credibly commit to control your sovereign power, you either won't get the capital you want, or you'll get it at a very, very high cost, much to the cost of your future development. So you won't have sustainable, or what was feasible, sustainable development. You'll have a low and steady state sustainable development. Steady state low development. So you want to move from a low growth path to a high growth path. To access your capital markets, you've got to make a credible commitment that you will control the use of your coercive powers. So owning state-owned enterprises is one problem that has to be overcome, but you can't privatize state-owned enterprises. Why? Because they charge other users for their services and are very often tempting means for governments to raise revenue other than taxation. So it's the same as being exposed to giving someone money. You invest money in a downstream activity in a local economy, and then the government who owns the upstream necessary essential input puts prices up to extract profit out of you. Same problem. So then how do you privatize your telecom? Well, you can't privatize your telecom because no one will buy it if you don't have a regulatory framework in place that credibly commits you not to price below opportunity cost when the time comes. Because if there's any likelihood of you pricing below the investor's opportunity cost, they won't invest, or they'll charge you a sovereign risk premium that's very high, again, condemning you to a low growth path. So if you are really clear about your objective and you really do want to help your people rather than the elite who, who, who support you, then you need a wider economic framework that involves incentives to invest and trade. You need competition and consumer law because at the end of the day, you still are the sovereign power in the land. And unless there's an independent body with a set of rules that are clear about when property can be taken, for example, for access to water or for access to energy on the, on the grid, then again, there is a lot of uncertainty about what prices will be earned. So competition and consumer law is about setting the rules that will again safeguard private investors 
not only against the opportunism of the state, but the opportunism of other competitors. So you may have Vodafone turn up in your jurisdiction, but then O2 wants to as well, or you've got British Telecom wants to enter. They will find it easy to enter as the second mouse getting the cheese once the first ma the mouse has built the network, so long as they can come along and convince the government to give them cheap access to that network. So competition law is also about regulating the relationships not between, only between investors and the state, but between investors themselves, where those investors can seek to use the powers of the state to change the terms of the trade that uh, underlie the original investment. So you need clear, simple, targeted and efficient rules. Otherwise, they will expand. They will expand to cover any opportunity that someone sees or perceives to seize the assets of others. You need an independent institution, independent, that is, of the ultimate power in the land, to ensure this credible commitment, like Ulysses, tying himself but hands behind the, the, uh, the mast in order to pass the sirens without bringing the ship to, to ruin. There is a need to assign the enforcement of the law to an independent body in order to be able to commit to these rules. So my 10 minutes is up. The problem, though, is with small states, and I've got data here that I'm not even going to get to, but as has been outlined so many times already, that may only in the Pacific Island, there's five nations with populations of 10,000 people. Uh, you've got people 20,000, 50,000, the big states are 1.5 million. These, the institutions and the expertise and capacity, I would say, therefore, you need to look at regional arrangements and starting points in the design of the mechanisms and procedures for the enforcement of the law. The regional arrangements really have two rationales. One is the externalities rationale, where if you have a cartel in one jurisdiction distorting prices, it may affect the prices in another jurisdiction. So when it's regulated in one jurisdiction, it'll actually affect outcomes in another jurisdiction. And that's the, therefore, regulation has externalities because the cartel is trading in cross-border. Now, that's one region, reason to take a regulatory function upwards to a higher level and you know contiguous bo trading bound borders between proximate nations used to be the basic reason for doing it but now with weightless you know transport and the knowledge economy and whatever uh, more globalized economy you you are looking to the growth of the role of international law you're we're observing it we're not looking to it we're actually observing it and it isn't actually an, a function of this need to govern the relationships cross border where there are these external effects for the small state, though, more, uh, just more important than for the large state is the fact that you've only got 10,000 people. Um, we estimated that to run a competition authority like the Australian one or New Zealand one would cost about $2 million a year. That's a lot of money to invest. So you've got the usual choice as a government. You can either, to get an independent regulator, make it yourself, appoint a judge, make them independent, or you can contract it out. And so it's the contracting out option and then sharing that cost that gives you the second rationale for regional arrangements, which is the unit cost of even local decisions go down. It may be a purely local decision that has no effect between Tonga and Samoa or you know, Jamaica and Barbados or, or, or wherever, Mauritius and, Ma and Maldives. There's no inter really in interdependency here between the way things are regulated. It's a purely local decision. But actually, just the $2 million would be good to share because the capability to enforce laws is like an option we can all draw on. So we can have a court like the Caribbean devised. And that was the insight that the, looking at the various options that existed for the Pacific Island Forum, it seemed like the CARICOM was offering, offering one of the best with its regional, regional body, which can draw on judicial expertise around the world. Um, of course, also, you can look to private arbitration fora you know, there were, when you look into the Middle Ages, hundreds of courts in England. So as I say, if you pose this as a problem about how do parties who are making a decision now decide their relationship will be governed in the future, it actually makes it much more manageable to understand what needs to be done. You need to create an institution that delivers on the party's reasonable expectations about what will happen if they get into a dispute. How do you find such an entity? Usually there's one around somewhere, applying its trade and offering certainty, and maybe a different spin on things. 
So you can contract it out. There are plenty of judges. There's the Privy Council. There's the Australian High Court around the world, the US Supreme Court, even some of the federal courts. So it's, it's really a market in enforcement and uh, dispute resolution services. And once you get there and realise that actually sovereignty is of no use at all if all you do with it is condemn your population to poverty and early death and ignorance, you use sovereignty to create well-being and you do that actually by controlling its use, not by letting it unfettered. Fettered. You make reasonable deals with the reasonable other parties to invest in your country and foster trade going forward. So that, I think, would solve many of the problems that just the data shows that the total small states population, as we've seen, is 37 million. Their GDP is not even as big as New Zealand's when you combine them all together. But New Zealand is only 4.5 million people. So the GDP per capita averages 5.2 million. So we talk here about small states having problems with their institutions, but we've got to take it back to our objectives. What we're trying to do here is to deliver well-being to these people who are dying at 35 from diseases that could be cured and not able to pay for their children's health and education. Some of the states are doing better than others. The Pacific Island Forum has 14 states. Its average is below the overall average. Caribbean economy is doing much better at around 10,000 per annum. <coughs> Uh, the African associations, which we looked at as means for organising these uh, integration and, uh, and uh, dispute resolution topics that we've got as the, as the topic of our conversation, but really an economist would say we're just promoting economic well-being. When you look at the uh, Paci Pacific Island, there's, some big, there's a big one, Papua New Guinea, but it's very poor. And there's a Fiji who's doing reasonably well and, and about a million. But as I say, some of them are tiny, you know, 2,000 people in Nui. They can't have a Supreme Court of the United States in Nui. The Bahamas, what we found when we looked at their laws, it correlated a lot with their economic development. The top two had reasonably well-developed competition laws, consumer laws, and, uh, and whatever. The, the, the middle group were a bit muddled, uh, but the bottom group had none. So this was patchy, and down the bottom was none. And it was you know, pretty much following economic capacity. When we looked at the Bahamas, there seemed to be a lot of merit in what some of the countries had worked out, which was to create a favourable environment for investment and capital, which big states don't like, because you're offering them a better environment for their corporations to register than they seem to be wanting to do, because they would like to milk their large and successful corporations for political purposes. So I think the Caribbean has a lot to be credited for in the way uh, some of its nations have developed quite quickly with GDP per capita is now up around 20,000 and growing fast. And a lot of those are, when you do the statistical analysis with large databases, as Tamika Dharmapal has been doing in the US, you hear all this talk about um, tax havens and you know, money laundering places in, in various regions that we should do something about. What he finds is that successful tax havens, a lot of countries try to do that, but the only ones that actually succeed are those that offer rule of law. Because what you're saying to his foot free cap foot, you know, fleet foot capital is come to our country, put your money here, and we won't take it off you. The only way you can actually credibly commit to do that is with rule of law. And that's where really what this is all about. And so consumer law, competition law, they're particular manifestations of just basically general rule of law. And if you do achieve that rule of law, your economy does grow a lot faster. So integration and, and uh, international dispute resolution, despite the distaste many people have for lawyers and, and so on, I think is fundamental to the economic growth of wealth nations because it creates the framework. Something that we learned from monetary policy was that if you keep using monetary policy to stimulate the economy whenever there's an election, then eventually inflation gets out of control. What you need to do is put an independent governance structure around the Reserve Bank and credibly commit not to simply turn on the taps every time the politics isn't looking good. When you do that, you get low inflation and higher growth. That same kind of temptation applies to the law. Stop setting access prices for infrastructure investment that is too low for the investors to recover their return, and you'll see more investment and more economic growth. Thank you.
I think George must have been a barman in his student days. He managed to avoid my eyes. 